If you look at this picture, you can see some trees. I know a lot of you care about trees. You also see some, some forest insects, which is also a theme for a number of people at Fabi. And then down here in the corner, you especially see the, the fungus. So fungal pathogens are clearly a, an area in which your institute has contributed enormously. And uh, um, I'll try and bring them into the talk today too. And I'll try and connect these three groups of organisms around the theme of plant volatiles. So this is the fact that plants actually use volatiles and use them in interactions with other organisms is certainly nothing that is new to scientists. Anyone that's grown up, well, especially in a place like uh, South Africa, where you've got all those wonderful, wonderful flowers and fruits around there knows that you get some really nice smells out of them. You also have a lot of smelly plants. And so people for years really have, have uh, realized that plants do smell and often there's a reason in terms of um, keeping away enemies or attracting pollinators or fruit dispersal agents or things like that. Um, but most of this field was really rather informal until a point about 30 years ago or so. So yeah, I think it was sort of the end of the 1980s. Um, the technology for trapping compounds in headspace in a sensitive way started to be developed and released to the scientific community. So this is a technology that was really developed by people working with, uh, with air pollutions. And with air pollutants, they were able to trap compounds and the scientists took this over. In the early 90s, it became very cheap. We also got very sensitive GC mass spectrometers also at this time. And so suddenly there was a real a rush, a real gold rush of doing some science and looking for, for volatiles in, in plants. And a lot of ecologists jumped on this. And probably the main discovery was that plant, not only flowers and fruits, release volatiles, but all plants release some compounds and especially after herbivore damage, um, when they're damaged by herbivores. Um, so after all this work, really, there was an awful lot of, um, I guess I have a little bit of, just to show you a series of pictures, all these different organisms have really been shown to be involved in interacting with plants through volatiles. These are organisms that detect volatiles and respond to them. So lots and lots of work has really gone on since the time in the 90s and almost every issue of Journal of Chemical Ecology, for instance, phytochemistry has several papers about, about this theme. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna tell you today though is some work that we started a few years ago and this is really due mostly to one particular coworker in the group who was very interested in volatiles. And when we were discussing what kind of area there seemed to be a lack of knowledge. She mentioned that in trees, it just seemed like there wasn't a lot of work on trees and other woody plants. And she was also the type of person who really wanted to study. She realized that most of the work had been done on cultivated plants. And she wanted to know whether volatiles as a whole might act in the wild in the same way that we were studying them in agricultural systems. And so this is the person, Sibylla Unsicker, who's been a coworker of mine for a number of years, a wonderful ecologist. And she set out to look for a native system where she could study woody plant volatiles to be able to under, try and understand what their role might be in natural systems. And she ended up finding this wonderful stand of trees in a floodplain um, in Eastern Germany. Um, and what you're looking at is mostly poplars here. These are black poplar. There are about 400 trees in this area of which is now a natural reserve. It was protected for many years because it was a military reserve. And so um, as researchers, we of course had to sign a release that said if we got blew up by an unexploded bomb, we wouldn't sue the government, which of course we all signed. And uh, and fortunately, nothing happened. You see one of our researchers uh, bravely wandering through the, the water without even looking at his feet. Um, so the, the bigger dangers were actually the, uh, the foxes and the, uh, we've had another, other animals and the floods, uh, much more than the military ordinance. But it's really been a nice place to work. And um, thanks to Sibylla, we were able to study a lot of different things there. Let me just show you where it is. This is the arrow showing it's 
It's on the eastern border of Berlin, I'm sorry, of Germany with Poland, the Oder River. Um, and uh, there is a, this nice island actually in the middle of this, which has all these nice poplar trees. So what Sibylla did there was she studied a number of volatiles in connection with a number of different kinds of organisms. And I'll, I'll sort of focus on three of her stories. Um, one is with herbivores. Um, she worked especially on um, a lepidopteran called the gypsy moth. Um, you may have heard of it. This is an organism that has outbreaks, especially in North America and other parts of the world um, where it's been introduced. In Germany, it's mostly endemic and you don't see a whole lot of them um, in an outbreak mode, but you do find them in stands of trees pretty regularly like in this, in, in this reserve. Um, in addition, um, She also worked with herbivore enemies. Um, and in particular, there's a parasitic wasp here. This is a braconid wasp, Glyptopontelis liparetus, which lays its eggs in the gypsy moth and then parasitizes it. The um, moth never, the, the larva never develops into a moth. And after about the third or fourth instar, it really dies and there's no pupa. Um, and so this was another one of the organisms to focus on. And then I'll also tell you a little bit about this nice pathogen, this bright orange fungus, Melampsera larissi populina. So I'll tell you about them in, in, in this order, the three stories I have about different organisms that Sibylla found really in this reserve and their relationship to poplar through the volatiles. So let's start with the communication with herbivores. And this is a story that actually starts with a, one of her nice graduate students, Andrea McCormick, um, now in New Zealand, who started out by looking, she was very interested in how the, um, the gypsy moth caterpillars perceive the poplar tree with volatiles. And so she started out doing some general experiments. And what I'm showing you here is data that shows that the larvae will choose plant, in these are choice tests where they have the option of, um, so they chose leaves of poplar over clean air, which you might expect. So this is again, um, volatile cues. They also choose leaves that have been damaged by herbivores over undamaged leaves. So that implies another level, maybe a volatile detection. And then perhaps most interesting that after there's a long-term herbivory, um, larvae that had never fed on poplar before still prefer the, the herbivory, but those that had experience with at least one feeding bout will then leave and go to undamaged leaves. So they, there's clearly acceptance and rejection as well. And then what she decided to do is break down the volatile blend a little and test individual compounds to see which were important. And she used this four-way olfactometer, which is a arena with air streams coming from different directions. You put the caterpillar in the middle and then what she did is photograph it and you end up with this nice heat map. And what this kind of map shows you, for instance, is that here, um, if you have solvent or air blowing over solvent in all four directions, you can see the caterpillars don't really choose where they go. But if you had a repellent compound, for instance, on one side um, coming from this arm, you can see that they really avoid this particular arm more than, and spend more time in the other arms. So doing these kinds of experiments, Andrea was able to show that a number of the different categories of volatiles were responded in a different way. And I'll just, this gives me a chance to introduce some of the chemistry here. There's a group of chemical compounds called green leaf volatiles because they smell to us at least like green leaves. And these are C6 based uh, fragments of fatty acids. These are lipoxygenase products of uh, C18 um, fatty acids. Um, and it turned out that most of these were attractants to the larvae. Um, hexanol, hexanoacetate, and hexanal are the, are the major ones. She also looked at a number of terpenes. Um, as Almond mentioned, this is an area that's long been one of my favorites. Unfortunately, the terpenes were not that exciting in this study. Um, there were some that had no effect and a number that were attractants. She also found that aromatics were another major group of volatiles. And here we found one in compound in particular or two, salicyl aldehyde and benzaldehyde that were strong repellents of the larvae um, in the volatile blend. And then finally, the most interesting compounds are ones that we didn't expect at all. 
there were a number of nitrogen containing compounds here. Um, um, in this, and this aldoxine below and a nitrile here, benzyl cyanide. And these had never been reported from poplar before and really not been studied very much in plant volatile blends at all. But we found them to be fairly major components in the poplar volatile blend. And we also found that um, the, uh, although benzyl cyanide had no activity, the aldoxine um, was here, was a strong repellent. So this got us interested then in looking forward in a little bit more about detail about the nitrogen containing compounds. And um, in fact, we actually looked at their effect on larval performance in the gypsy moth. And Andrea found that the aldoxine here, this N-hydroxyl compound was really quite toxic. Um, you can see here the comparison between in an artificial diet when we add the compound, they're present at about five micrograms per gram in poplar foliage after herbivore attack. So these are natural concentrations and there was a definite decline in uh, survival and also in uh, the average weight of the larvae. So this was toxic, but what was strange is that the aldoxine caused this decrease in growth, but the benzyl cyanide itself was not active. And if you we go back to this slide that I had here, it, it, there was a disconnect here. So here we have the, the aldoxine below was not active as a repellent, um, but is active as a um, um, attractant. And um, I need to move this window so I can make sure that you are seeing the, the yeah, get the, my titles are there. So there was sort of a disconnect. We had one compound that was toxic and not repellent and the other was repellent and not toxic. Um, so, as a conclusion of this study, well, first of all, I think it's important to tell you the net, the net attractant or repellent effect of the overall blend you can see is really made up of the contribution of different components. And that was something we really, I think, learned very well in this study. Um, you could have a repellent component that if it wasn't very dominant would actually end up, um, the blend as a whole could be attractive. But we were also very curious about this disconnect between toxicity and uh, deterrence. And um, that we ended up thinking about this a bit. Um, and the main conclusion was that plants need to be both toxic and deterrent. Um, if you think about this from a evolutionary or ecological perspective, if a compound is deterrent, but not actually toxic, um, the insects may figure this out and eventually start feeding on the plant. So this is not a stable evolutionary solution. If you're toxic and not deterrent, well, that's not great either. The herbivore might die, but you might lose a lot of tissue if you're the plant. So we sort of concluded that it's good to have compounds that are both toxins and deterrents. But if individual compounds aren't that way, um, what we thought was a little bit novel about our system where we had an aldoxime and this nitrile together, these two compounds are actually very closely related biosynthetically. There's all, they're one step apart. A cytochrome P450 uh, converts the phenylalanine to the aldoxime, and then another one converts it on to the benzyl cyanide. So they're actually both present in the plant um, at the same time, and maybe this is one way that plants get around this problem of having just one compound that's active in this one particular way is by having both of them in a similar pathway. Um, so I particularly like that story because it was a way to say that, hey, biosynthesis can be important and we really have to care about how compounds are made. But I think I almost heard that, uh, <laughs> that song a time or two before. Okay, so let's move on to story number two here. And this is a story actually about this little wasp, this parasitic wasp. Um, and what I can tell you is that in the early days when people started figuring out there were all these volatiles coming out of herbivore damaged plants, this was really the sexy reason that this was a way to call in herbivore enemies. And um, this, this was what was most exciting. The argument was that the plant is calling for help and the volatiles are help bring in enemies. And that's what causes, um, that's the reason, whole reason that plants really um, have been selected for producing these compounds. So there unfortunately hasn't been a whole lot of evidence in support of this and especially true in natural systems and in woody plants. So Andrea grabbed this question 
And she was very curious about how this little um, parasitic wasp reacts then to, um, to damaged foliage, foliage damaged by the, um, by the gypsy moth. And so here's some data for you. Um, what you see here is that when you ask the, when you, again, this is an olfactometry test, when you ask males of the little wasp here, they don't seem to care what kind of foliage uh, is present that you're giving them, but females do. They were much more attracted to um, gypsy moth damaged foliage as the undamaged, significantly more. And then after they've had a chance to oversit once on, uh, um, on, a, on, a cat, on a gypsy moth caterpillar, we call them experienced, and then they choose even more strongly. So there's something in the volatile blend coming from gypsy moth damaged foliage that's attracting females of this particular little wasp. So the question was, what is that compound? And um, we actually, it, it took a while to try and look at the mixtures of blends and try and figure this out. And what Sibylla ended up doing was bringing in some nice multivariate statistics where it's actually a machine learning algorithm, which starts to pick out which compounds are typical of which blend. And eventually we discovered, the, the algorithm told us that for the undamaged leaves, there were actually a number of terpene compounds were typical, but of the gypsy moth damaged leaves, we had the nitrogen containing compounds and also some green leaf volatiles that were characteristic of this. So again, this is a, an algorithm that tries to discriminate between the two situations by choosing the characteristic volatiles. So this actually gave us a number of compounds to go after. And of course, what was exciting was to see these nitrogen containing compounds again here. And then what Andrea did is really a, a wonderful series of experiments. Um, the next thing she did was to take the, this poor little wasp and look at the antenna in detail in an electrophysiological sense, looking to see which compounds the antenna could detect. And it turned out that it could detect these, these nitrogen-containing compounds, two aldoxenes and one of the nitriles were the most detectable compounds, the strongest detection in the of, of all the ones that she tested. So this was also quite exciting. And, um, but the electrophysiology only tells you that the compounds are being detected. You don't know whether they're actually attractants or repellents. So Andrea then had to check out the moss. She had already tested the caterpillar with these compounds, but then she went ahead and tested the, uh, um, the wasp here. And it turned out that um, strikingly, once again, these three nitrogen containing compounds that she studied were the most attractive to um, this, um, the, the, this parasitoid. And then the whole reason for doing our study out of doors really was to say that maybe we should go back up to uh, our little island in the Oda River and then see if we could test this out there. And Andrea was brave enough. Um, I don't know if she waded the river when it was quite as full as um, Andy Bookler. He was a little bit more of a um, um, outdoorsy, I guess, as you see him in the water here, but he actually helped quite a bit as well in installing all these traps. And what Andrea and Andy and Sibylla did was they put up these sticky traps, which had volatile dispensers um, associated with them to give out different odors. And they put them as sort of in this combination as sort of an interceptor trap that also has uh, um, um, these volatiles in it. And then they were able to trap um, um, any organism that came over a period of, of, of two weeks. And then she ended up looking to see what kind of organism she found. And the results were actually um, really, really satisfying. It turned out that um, in the field then, the most attractive compound to a group of one of the group, major groups of parasitoids, the ichneumonid wasps, was again, um, one of the nitrogen containing compounds. And the other major group, the burkhanid wasps, um, the other large group of, of insect parasitic wasps, there was a different compound, but also again, a nitrogen containing compound was one of the ones that were significantly attracted more of these insects compared to the other compounds and the solvent control. Um, so these results suggested that um, this is really the first time for woody plants and the first time for a natural system that we showed that this call for help might actually um, work in that uh, the volatiles released by a damaged plant will attract an appropriate insect which could 
again, an enemy of, of, of the herbivore in question. Um, so this was very, very exciting data. And um, the next step really was Andrea's own curiosity. She really wondered why these nitrogen containing volatiles were so important. Um, I, it was enough for me that she showed these wonderful new compounds were important, but Andrea was really concerned about what was special about these compounds in the biological sense. And I think if you think about it, you realize that the, the, the parasitoid wants to find its prey here, the herbivore, and not really just the damaged plant. So it should favor the kinds of volatiles that actually show you where the insect is, not necessarily the plant damage. And another point that Andrea, another hypothesis was that this emission of volatiles should really be in some sense independent of environmental conditions. Whenever the insect is there, the plant should emit the compound. So it's a really honest and reliable signal for the gypsy moth caterpillars being there. And when Andrea invested that, this, what she did is we went back to some biosynthetic data that we had, and this is really from Sandra Ermish. So if you, if you label the leaves of the poplar in a developmental sequence, and then you put an herbivore on specific leaves and look at volatiles collected individually. So what we're looking at here is if only leaf three has an herbivore, then it turns out that only leaf three emits these nitrogen containing volatiles. If only leaf 10 is damaged, only leaf 10 emits. And the control you see these compounds aren't emitted by all. So this it turns out to be the most faithful group of compounds in terms of emission. There was nothing about the next leaf in a lot of the terpenes and a lot of these other compounds that are produced from damaged foliage. They were emitted much less discriminately. Um, so this turned out to be very reliable. And here's just to show you one of the, of the cytochrome P450 gene expression was also very true to the specific leaf. And this is presumably why this emission, the pathway is really activated only directly where the damage is occurring and the volatile is released. Then Andrea actually looked at this over a longer time course here. And what I'm showing you is a period of four days here. There's the trace of admission of, of emission of this uh, aldoxine um, with herbivory and there's the control. And we put the herbivores on here at what we call time zero. And you can see the emission goes up. Um, the first time we measured it, it was already far higher than the control. And when the herbivores come off, you can see the emission drops right back down. And there's a little bit of a tail here, but it's fairly rapid. So this is really fairly unique among a lot of these compounds. If you, okay, here's the light in the dark periods. I guess I also should make the point that at, at, even at night or whether daytime or night, this compound is emitted. So it's a very good cue that the caterpillars are there. And if I compare this to one of uh, Andrea's other graphs here, this is a terpene you're now looking at, which is also sometimes considered a signal for damaged foliage. But look, it takes a lot longer to, to rise at the beginning. Um, and you can see the herbivores come off right here at 48 hours, but this compound is still emitting um, in this day-night rhythm here for another 24 hours at least. So Andrea's conclusion was that this nitrogen-containing compound just happened to be a very reliable signal for the damage. And presumably this may be one reason why this parasitoid has learned to use it. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's a very nice story and uh, um, really, a, between Sibyl and Andrea was a fantastic collaboration, so need to give them the credit. Um, and it was also wonderful that we were able to see this up, on the, up in the field. So now let me, um, for those of you who've gone to sleep waiting for the pathogens, here come, here come our microbes, finally. Um, uh, a nice little story about the rust, and we actually owe this story, of course, to Almond as well, because if not for her, I don't think we ever would have looked at it. But Sibylla already was up on the island and noticed that at certain times of the year, there were in, um, outbreaks of, of this leaf rust. And uh, she also noticed that the caterpillars would also tend to prefer plants that had rust on them. So this Melampsera larissi populina is a basidiomycete. It's uh, a biotroph that's a plant pathogen. And it's really the most widespread pest of poplars, both cultivated and in the wild that people have noted. And, very, very widespread. As the name implies, it actually has a two hosts. It's also present on larch as part of its life cycle and then also poplar um, more later in the year. 
And thanks to Almut's influence, really, we were brave enough to go ahead and, and uh, uh, go ahead and study it. So Sibylla and Almut actually had a supervised, uh, co-supervised a wonderful student, another PhD student named Francisca Abril. And when Franzi started her work here, the first thing she showed that this attraction that Sibylla had noted in the field was also true in the lab, that the, cat the gypsy moth larvae were attracted to the foliage of, of the poplar. And she also noted that they also fed more when the rust fungus was there. So um, um, after the, the damage increase of the rust fungus, you can see that again in this, this, these uh, binary tests here, the caterpillars fed more and more on the rust fungus. So there was, they clearly were telling us there's something good about the rust. And um, um, it was really uh, then Franzi's challenge to figure out what was really going on. And so we're talking about volatiles. So let me bring you back to the volatiles. We've, she first looked at what happened to volatile emission after the fungus. And you can see in the data right here with the terpenes, these are the compounds that were mostly attractants here. There was a decline in volatile emission after um, the rust fungus. Um, so this would not be expected to attract the gypsy moth. There were less attractants. So this probably wasn't the explanation. Um, in the nitrogen compounds, which um, as you remember are mostly repellents, there was also a decline, although in this case, not statistically significant. Um, so that might be responsible then for this change in uh, behavior that it's not that they're more attractants, but that they're more repellents. But perhaps also more interesting is that the, the plants that had the rust fungus on actually had some of their own volatiles that are produced by the fungus. So in principle, the caterpillars could also use this compound. This is, a, this is the compound that smells like mushrooms to our noses. And it's produced by the rust fungus. And as you can see, it also was present in much, it only accompanied the rust, we just didn't find it in other cases. So volatiles could be involved in this interaction. Um, Franzi went on actually and, and showed some other nice data. She also looked at uh, plant defense signaling. And I think you, uh, are probably familiar with this. Um, jasminates are a, um, a group of plant hormones really, which are involved in signaling after herbivore damage and stimulating defenses against herbivores. And you can see they increased after herbivory, but in the presence of rust, there was less jasminate. Um, and you see this in the gene expression here of the gene of jasminate biosynthesis. And at the same time, those of you who are familiar with jasminate and trade-offs with other hormones, there was an increase in salicylic acid, um, which is a, a hormone response fairly typical for a biotrophic pathogen like the rust. Um, and, and then what actually, what Franzi was able to do is actually by spraying methyl salicylate on the plant, she was able to copy the effects of rust infection on the hormone profile. So she ended up showing that when you sprayed methyl salicylate, you also got a decline in the jasminates and an increase in methyl salicylate. And you also got the decline in um, the volatiles. So this suggests that what was happening is the fungus was altering the hormone balance of the plant and that was really decreasing the volatiles. So we understood the mechanism then, at least of why this change in volatiles was happening. Um, but that still left some nice questions for Franzi to, to go on with. The question of really why are gypsy moth larvae attracted to these rust infected leaves. So what I've, I've told you already that there was, perhaps it's because there was less repellence. Um, but one of the other ideas is that really there's possibly, um, you've got lower nitrogen containing compounds, maybe there's less risk of parasitoids or other enemies. So maybe that's a good reason why the caterpillars are choosing the rust infected plant. We actually haven't tested that idea. So it's still, uh, um, it's still under the possible ideas, but it's certainly something that we'll um, perhaps come back to. Um, so here's the data for the volatile. So the decline in this repellent volatile here might be important in uh, reason why we have more um, herbivores attracted to the rust. Um, another hypothesis is as I just, I talked to you a little about the hormones here, the rust infected leaves had less jasminate and more salicylate. And this might mean 
that they're actually less defended against herbivores. And in fact, Franzi did show nicely that one group of plant defenses against herbivores in poplar protease inhibitors went down significantly under the influence of the rust fungus. So this might be another reason why the caterpillars are going to the rust fungus plant. They're actually using this, the fungus hormone, the hormone balance being changed is causing a change in uh, the plant defense. And then another reason that really, this one is really all Franzi, is the idea that the fungus might actually be more nutritional, the fungus infested foliage and the plant foliage. And she was able to show in a very nice study that the, the, the caterpillars actually did much, much better when they had fungus in their diet. So they significantly more weight and they also had higher survival. Um, and she was able to show this was due to the nitrogen and amino acids that they were more in their diet. Um, and she also was able to show what some of the attractive cues are for feeding stimulation. Um, so um, I'll try and leave you, I won't go any more into this, but just let you, I think what hopefully you can appreciate is that when we brought a pathogen into the system, this plant herbivore system, we really changed the dynamics completely. And all of a sudden the preference of the herbivore, the ability of the plant to defend itself, all of these things dramatically changed by the presence of the fungus. Um, so I hope I haven't kept you too long. Um, I do, it'd be nice to have a discussion. Let me just stop and sum up and then um, I'll be happy to take questions. What I um, hopefully showed you is that, first of all, that uh, um, you should care about plant volatiles because they're important in a lot of these different ecological interactions. Um, we've recorded over 80 different volatiles from poplar. Um, there are a lot of them there. Some of them were attractive, some of them repellent to herbivores. Uh, what we were able to show, I think, is that the blend of compounds is, can be unpredictable in its effect. Um, and you have to remember the blend and, but it does show the complexity and shows us there's a lot more work to do in really understanding which volatiles are important in each situation. We also showed then that some of the compounds that might, volatiles that might be repellent were not necessarily toxic and some that weren't, re were toxic were not necessarily repellent, um, which is an interesting kind of uh, conundrum to be involved in, but maybe, um, uh, both kinds of activities are really important for a stable defense, and maybe this is one reason to have a mixture of volatiles. Maybe they all work together in this kind of a dual defensive role um, against uh, herbivore enemies. Um, another thing I hope I've shown you is that these, these nitrogen-containing compounds are, are definitely special, and they serve as sort of in this classic plant cry for help role um, for herbivore enemies. We have here a very dedicated specialist um, enemy, this, this little braconid wasp, that's really queuing in on these nitrogen-containing compounds and finding, um, finding the caterpillars and laying its eggs on them. And it's actually chosen the compound that it seems most sensitive to for a very good reason. This is a very, very reliable cue for the presence of the caterpillar, these nitrogen-containing compounds. So a very nice, uh, satisfying, adaptive explanation for its behavior for the herbivore attraction. And then of course we showed that the pathogens, as I just said, um, they really mess things up. Um, we have a lot of different things going on and uh, they influence attraction. They may influence defense against the herbivory and they may do this by affecting the signaling balance between the two. Um, and um, yeah, I think it was, it was very exciting to see this. Um, perhaps you can appreciate this as well as anybody else who, because you work with trees. Out there in nature, we really aren't seeing individual um, herbivores interacting with, with a plant. Uh, a tree obviously has many herbivores and probably many pathogens at the same time. So the balance between what enemies are really more important varies with time, varies with space. And it looks like volatiles may be involved in sort of determining this thing, but this means we have a lot of work to do because the different compounds have very different effects in different contexts and they're affected in turn by the kinds of enemies that are there. Um, so um, I think this really helps open the door for, for looking at a lot with volatiles, particularly in terms of trees, but it's clear that we have a lot more work to do before we understand uh, some of the general principles. 
Um, so let me just stop right there then and um, thank the people that did the work. I, I've mentioned some of the names here already. Um, here's um, Sibylla and Andrea who really worked on the herbivore side. Um, you all know Ahmet. Um, I've, I've refrained from any embarrassing pictures. This is, a, I think, a hopefully a pretty flattering one. And uh, Ahmet was really very, very important in this work because of, especially when we brought in uh, the rust fungus. And uh, this Francisca Abril was a wonderful PhD student that uh, was really supervised by Ahmet and Sibylla together. And in the middle of these other two, these are our biochemists. Uh, Tobias and Sandra really worked out the biosynthesis of these nitrogen containing volatiles and which helps support the ecological work in a nice way. So I, I thank these people. Um, I need to thank the Institute and some of the funding agencies. And um, I thank you for listening. Thank you, Jonathan, that was really great. So, um, guys, if you have any questions for Jonathan, then you can either unmute yourself and, and ask the question, or you can write it in the chat box. So, while nobody else has yet asked something, I'll just take the chance. Um, the, okay, so I see Chris Weldon has his hand up. So, Chris, do you want to wanna ask a question? Chris, I think you unmuted. I, yep, I've, I've just unmuted myself now. I wanted to turn my video on. Um, thanks for a great talk, um, Jonathan. I, I've got two questions, if, if, I'm, if I may. Um, I, I may have missed it in your talk, but the, the first thing I wanted to ask was, um, you know, in, when you were looking at the herbivore, the larval mortality, it, it seems to occur quite slowly in response to the, the aldoxine. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder, was that mortality and, and also the slower development um, due to no feeding or, or what was it due to no feeding rather than toxicity itself? If you could yeah. just um, explain that a bit more. No, it's a good question. You know, it could be because, yeah, and, and one that's really not, it's hard to parse things like that without actually doing direct measurements of frass and, and really what they're eating. Um, so it is, it is a good question. Um, I think, to be honest, we did go far enough with it. We had a toxicity effect in some of the data. So I think we can say that there was an actual toxicity, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to say how much of the effect was really due to feeding deterrency and much due to the actually dying um, because the death was slow, as you pointed out. Um, um, I guess the ecological argument is that slow Development is also a good defense because that gives a lot more chance for enemies to go ahead and, and, and parasitize or, or prey on it. Um, so things don't have to die right away, um, as, as, as I'm sure you realize. Um, but yes, we, we, we didn't, I don't think we adequately separated the two. Thanks for that. Um, my second question, um, it, it has to do with the, the observation that the, the parasitoid overposition um, the, an ex, the experience led to greater levels of oviposition. So what, what might be an explanation for that? Um, in other studies that have been done, which, which we haven't done, it really is, a, there's a neurological um, connection. They learn. Um, and it's, it's about the volatiles that, so when they oviposit successfully, um, they, they learn the conditions and, um, um, insects like this, even a, um, this insect, which is fairly as a specialist, um, will use that and, 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 and then um, adapt its behavior um, to it. And so there's a, there's, this, is, this has been known in the literature before. Um, so um, it's, it's considered to have a, a neurological basis. And it, um, it, in this case, I guess I'm assuming that it's odor and not texture or feel or something like that. But when it successfully oviposits, it, uh, the insects do store the memory somehow. They remember the sensation, they remember what it smelled like, and they go looking for that smell for the rest of their lives. So. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome, good questions. Okay, next question is from Michelle Reeve.
Michelle? Yes, hi. I was also just unmuting. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I also just, um, so I'm a Savannah ecologist, and when we think about herbivory in savannas, we usually think about or, uh, large herbivores, um, large mammals. Um, you touched on it a little bit that um, a plant will be exposed to a number of different herbivores, but I'm wondering whether you know anything about whether the herbivores, I mean, the deterrents for mammalian herbivores are in any way effective for insect herbivores or vice versa? Yeah, well, that's a great question. In fact, uh, I, I just, I, I've gotten papers to review recently where people have asked that question. So it's not, um, not in the African savanna. It's a uh, temperate, temperate report where people, so the, it's, it, it's a really good question. There is, in the studies that have been done, there are a number of, there's some overlaps um, between the two. But yet there's some other compounds which you may be aware of. I'll just give the proanthocyanidins, these condensed tannins as an example, which Amit knows well. Thanks to her, we developed a nice analytical platform for them. These are a, a group of compounds which are known to be um, effective against mammals feeding and um, spectacularly un uneffective against insects. Um, so there do seem to be specific compounds, um, but there also seem to be overlaps. Um, in, in, in poplar, we actually have salicinoids, which are known. The major defense is a, a group of uh, phenolic glycosides, and those seem to be effective against both um, in, in studies. So um, it's a very good question because um, what we also did, and, and there's some work that we have probably not taken far enough, but Sibylla actually looked at the differences in chemistry between the bottom two meters of the tree and then anything above that, assuming that a grazing mammal, of which there are a few even in Germany still left, um, would, uh, would, would uh, the defenses against the grazing uh, mammals should be present in the lower part of the tree and not higher up. And there are actually some very interesting chemical differences that occur. So the question is a very good one with the right kind of motivation and I, um, I, I think I, I hope you'll find out something in the savannas where there's perhaps more, um, or depending on the whether mammalian versus insect um, herbivory is more important, there might be some interesting differences in chemistry um, depending on what, um, um, I guess if you have giraffes though, maybe the <laughs> distance above ground has to be expanded a little bit from our little, uh, our little roe deer in Germany, but it would be really interesting to see if the distribution of compounds correlated with their effectiveness against uh, different organisms. So yes, there is that kind of data out there and uh, I hope you can, uh, you, can, you, can, you can find something that maybe develops on that theme. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We will we'll be doing some of this in the future with elephants. So wow. <laughs> um, so the next question is from, um, I guess it's Mike Winfield. Uh, you see, I keep you guessing. You don't know whether you're going to get me or Brenda. Jonathan, thanks for a, just a, a fabulous seminar. And I came in a few minutes late, for which I apologize. Um, I think we, you got me thinking about the incredible importance of transdisciplinary research, um, bringing together these different different systems and how much you know, value one gets from working across the disciplines. I was particularly interested in, and I should have remembered this because I think Almut has mentioned it previously, the, 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 the fact that... Uh, the, the, the uh, caterpillar um, larvae um, might be benefiting nutritionally from the rust fungus, um, which I was particularly interested in because I got pulled into a rather interesting observation that bees collect rust, rust spores at a time and seem to benefit from that. It's kind of strange. They, they'll they'll go, go to rust spores instead of pollen at, at some times. But that, that not, that's not a question, although I do think that we need to think a little bit more about other sim similar systems and what rust fungi might be um, doing in the, to benefit uh, various insect pests. But I think Michelle, to some extent, has, has asked that, that's, uh, the question that links to what I was thinking about, and it's that controversial issue of you know, whether trees or plants talk to each other. So herbivory on one plant influencing um, the attractiveness of other plants. Uh, you'll, you'll know, know that literature it became very controversial, I think, at the time of my PhD. Um, and I think started in an African sense. And, and the data that you presented would argue strongly against that. So, so leaves on the same plant um, 
that are not uh, fed upon seem not to be influenced um, mm -hmm. by feeding lower down. So then the influence on the next plant would be even less. But what, what, what's actually going on in terms of uh, current science to do with uh, the, the influence of these aromatics, say feeding on, on one plant um, on the attractiveness of other plants mm -hmm. close by? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very good point, Mike. And uh, I appreciate giving the chance because I think I, I don't want to leave you with really the impression that it doesn't matter. I think I didn't really show you the data on all the different kinds of chemistry, particularly the non-volatile compounds. So yes, I did show you that this particular group of volatiles is not emitted from adjacent foliage. Um, but we do see changes in adjacent foliage in other aspects of the chemistry like the protease inhibitors and some of these other compounds. So um, there actually is, it looks like the plant is listening. Um, we just don't know exactly what the chemical cues are. And um, so the, the take on the literature I think is much more sophisticated than it was. I think the trend, um, I, I think it's a good question to ask is, I think early on people were talking about trees talking to each other and plants talking to each other. and. Um, now the trend has gone that, well, these are very small amounts of compounds and there's a lot of wind out there. Maybe we should really care about internal plant signals. And certainly in a large tree, that would make sense. So people have begun to look in that. And there's some, some groups recently that have found specific compounds actually produced by plants, which seem to be perceived by other parts of the plant, which are changing their um, which the plant is responding to. So I think there's actually going to be at a much different level than was first researched, but the idea that trees do talk um, to each other is, is still alive, but especially branches, the, the individual ramets talk to each other. And the argument has been made, and I think well, that um, between different branches, a vascular connection might take a long time, because if you can imagine a vascular signal going all the way back to the roots, and all the way up to another branch, um, that may be really diluted compared to actually a spatial signal, a through air signal between two adjacent branches. And if there's gonna be a problem with an herbivore, maybe an adjacent branch that has a remote vascular connection to the fed on branch, but would nevertheless benefit from knowing that there was an herbivore there. So I think we're gonna learn a lot more about this and uh, there, there's, there's a lot going on. And maybe a lot of these compounds that we have not really understood so far are actually plant, plant internal signals. And maybe just to get a little bit controversial here, you could even say that maybe they're all originally plant, plant internal signals. It's actually the plant that was controlling it. And they've only later been perceived by all the other organisms and are reacting to them. Um, and so there, there are a little different ways to spin it evolutionarily. And I think it'll be exciting to find out what, what, what might have happened. No, thanks for that. That's great. The next question is from Jeremy Allison. And he asks if the larvae, the gypsy moth larvae, uh, continue feeding after they've been parasitized by this um, little wasp. And in that case, if they continue to feed, what would then be the informational value of these compounds which are emitted due to feeding? Ah, a very good question, yeah. Um, if they continue to eat and do damage, right, right. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's been asked about these ki um, parasitoids quite a bit. Um, the argument has been raised that they eat, but they eat, in many cases, they eat less, but it's absolutely true. If um, there might be hyperparasitoids, perhaps that would use them. Um, so that gives them information value perhaps, um, but maybe it doesn't help the plant. Um, so. I think where you're getting with this question is that um, the selective value of the signal to the plant might be mixed under these conditions. Um, and uh, which I think talk, speaks kind of to the answer I, I gave to, to Mike a little bit that we're not really clear who's winning the battle in terms of um, who, who's really controlling the information and who's really benefiting from it in all these cases. So uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question. And uh, um, um, I think um, in, in some of the parasitoids, there are more than one, they're sort of colonial. The, the one we studied is really a solitary endoparasitoid, 
So the first one that gets there, none of the others succeed. So in that case, um, the success of the, the volatiles that are produced after that, you're right, um, ha will have a very different kind of a value as a signal um, than, um, than, uh, than they might before if it was on parasitoids. The argument though, I should throw in that it's been shown that some of these parasitic wasps can tell by olfactory cues if another wasp has been there. So there may be these plant cues, but maybe they're overridden by a direct insect cue, which tells them, okay, not this one, let's go on to another one. But uh, so it's possible um, that where there's one caterpillar, there's another. So the signal may still work at a long range, but in close range, perhaps overridden. So um, yeah, excellent question about the possible conflicting selection pressures involved in these volatiles. Thanks, Jonathan. Then there's a question from Christina Bergman Nieto, I think. Um, and she um, is asking if these nitrogen compounds are emitted from other woody species as well, such as, for example, conifers. Yeah. Well, that's a species that everyone cares about, right? Maybe a conifer, right? <laughs> okay, but you, you care about a lot of species now, but you're right. Um, no, it's a, it's a good question. It turns out that they are emitted from conifers. We've actually studied them from uh, Texas, actually. Tobias stowed the, the genes and showed them there. They are a lot more widespread than we've thought about um, before. In conifers, they're usually ignored because you've got these terpenes that sort of dominate the volatile emission blend. Um, um, it would be interesting to go back and look for these in some of the conifer volatile, but there aren't really any reports. We found the genes and shown that they are produced under some condition. Um, in Taxus, which is what Tobias worked on, is not a plant with, with resins. Um, so maybe, that's, maybe there's a trade-off there. I'm not quite sure about other conifers. So they are something though that it'd be good to look out for in other woody species. Okay, yeah, it would be interesting. I would be interested in that. Um, uh, Lucky Marie is here versus asking, what would you think the best course of action would be to identify the active plant? She wants to know if it's analysis of internal responses and behavior of individual compounds with incremental addition of other compounds into synthesized blend, or should you do the whole blend? <laughs> or another one, or knocking out individual compounds from the whole blend. So you've got three options. You have the whole blend, you have uh, the whole blend minus one compound, or you have got a small blend that gets incrementally increased in in diversity? Yeah. Well, I think the best answer is, is, is yes. In other words, do it all. <laughs> um, um, it's, a, it's a good question. I think what people have typically done is, uh, I think the electrophysiology is kind of neat because it sort of narrows down the spectrum of compounds that they seem to care about. Um, so the antenna is, is a good way to go. And then when what, what people have usually done is start simple and then add compounds up with, as you said, incremental addition. And that's because we don't really know how much is there. Um, and um, sometimes these electrophysiological traces, you know, people that do these, you probably heard of the GCEAG where you're actually looking at a mass trace um, from flow of air coming from uh, over a, a antenna at the same time as the antenna response you see big responses to compounds that aren't even there. So I think because it's just so difficult to do this and know it's there, people have usually resorted to um, adding compounds in and hoping that they can repeat the response with one or two compounds. I think um, if, I, if I represent the literature accurately, I would say that people think there's a lot of redundancy built in to volatile perception and that many different signals can independently actually lead to the same response. So you add a compound, it might not change the response, but the individual compounds could actually separately cause this response. So that sort of votes for addition rather than subtraction um, there. But I, I think it would be, if we really understood blends in more detail, we might understand a lot more. It would really be exciting to actually know more about the, the uh, the, you know, the neurobiological structure of the olfactory cortex and things like that. Um, 
to understand a little bit more how some of these are perceived to be able to answer that. But um, I, would, I would add in instead of knockout and <laughs> start with electrophysiology. And uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, Dr. Marie is doing something like that. And she does actually do uh, this EAG. Oh, great, yeah. great. Well, um, good luck All with right. that. And uh, I, I think it is a very good way to go. And uh, as Alma knows well, another project that we've been working together on the bark beetle and the bark beetle fungus, um, we've actually, that's relied heavily on electrophysiology. And there it's also been very, very helpful tool really as kind of a, to show us what compounds the, the insect is responding to. So um, yeah, I, I certainly recommend it. Good luck. Sure. So Bruno and Slippers also have a question. Uh, thank you for an absolutely fabulous seminar. I'm wondering about this pathogen system. So how specific, have you looked at other pathogens in the system? How specific might this response be to a, a biotrophic pathogen? Yeah, uh, that's that's an excellent question. Almost, Almut can probably answer that. You want, <laughs> you want to talk about the other fungus? Uh, uh, you can, you can. Yeah, no, I, I, so. Oh. Alma, there was a, another one of her former PhD students who uh, I haven't let leave yet because uh, once she trains them, they, uh, they're, if I can't have Alma, at least I can have one of her former students. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this is someone we've actually looked at. Um, so we've looked at another, um, another pathogen. This is a stem pathogen, a canker call, a thing called plectospherellus. Uh, and um, there are some similar chemical responses. It's, it's a stem pathogen. So we haven't really looked at it with respect to the leaf and the volatiles in the same way. Um, but I guess, where am I going with this? No, we actually don't know anything about the volatile. So your argument about does, it, the plectospherella does cause hormonal changes in the same way uh, and effects that salicylate jasminate balance in the same way that the melamspora does. Um, but it's not a, it's a pathogen of stems and not leaves. So we actually didn't really pursue the question of stem of volatiles from stems or against the herbivore in the same way. But I, I think it's a great question because, you know, I told you a, a story about three species and you're, you're, you're asking, what does it mean for the rest of the world? So um, I think, we, you know, we do our best. Um, I think by the classifying by classifying pathogens, for instance, biotrophic, necrotroph, and looking at hormone balance, we're also trying to group them and talk <laughs> understanding about this. So I think um, in some respects you can do this, um, but I think because of the organ specificity in this case, um, there, you have to consider um, the special circumstances involved. Um, so yes, it's a good step forward. Let's, let's keep trying and let's hope that we aren't just talking about one example. Um, so just, to, just to add to Jonathan's answer, the, um, uh, Francisca actually did look at um, uh, the powdery volume on poplar leaves, and the insect responded in a very similar way to a rust fungus there. Okay, so the next question is from um, uh, Zanushka Nagu. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, thank you for the great talk, Jonathan. Uh, my question relates to changing climates and uh, how these uh, volatiles will be affected. And uh, with regard to protection of the trees and, and work you may be doing in that area, um, are you finding um, you know, significant changes in these uh, blends? And um, you know, what, what does it really mean in terms of you know, future uh, application <laughs> of... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, please go ahead. No, it's a very good question and uh, certainly one that's on our minds more and more. Um, even though we have rather a cool, damp spring here in Germany right now. Um, no, it's an excellent, I think people, um, we have not really addressed this question directly, but um, one thing of course is that with warming temperatures, volatiles might be better signals, right? Because of a lot of them, the vapor pressure um, is such that, um, they, they, they might be better communicators un, under warmer conditions. So at least just to say that, maybe this is actually gonna, might even help be a boon to communicating with other organisms. 
But at the same time, one of the things that actually has been studied in some depth is looking at the effect of, um, of, what, of what happens to um, pollution, particularly ozone and on these volatiles. And there actually have been a number of nice studies published which suggests that a lot of these volatile signals could be wiped out by ozone or by other um, reactive oxygen species in the atmosphere. And um, I think this has been used to say that maybe we should be worried about, will our bees still be able to find the plants when we have a lot of, um, this isn't directly um, maybe global warming, but it's global change if we have pollution like that. So that's a way in which um, the volatiles do tie in with, uh, with global um, change. And I think um, a, a number of studies have shown that the, these cues are very, very susceptible. The distance that they can travel and their abundance really depend on uh, um, what's happening else in the atmosphere. The presence of a lot of organic aerosols of other reactive oxygen species decreases their lifetime in the atmosphere. Um, and maybe this is gonna end up being important and might change the kinds of ability of plants to communicate um, in, a, in, a, in a much more polluted world. So no, it's a good, a very good question. And uh, if I were starting out these days, I might write a proposal on that basis because I think people are, are concerned about that. Um, but it would, it would be interesting to find out what, what the answers might be. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. The next question is from Shoan Ming Sun. I hope I didn't pronounce it too badly. Yeah, uh, you pronounced it correctly. Uh, hi, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much for your very inspiring talk. Uh, uh, so I have a question also related with this uh, plant volatiles. So you show, for example, there are these very specific plant volatiles that actually can repel or being toxic for the moss. Um, I, but we also know that actually, for for example, for insects, also for the natural enemies, that it's not only the individual uh, plant uh, volatiles, but also the blend, the com uh, composition, and also the ratio of, of different compounds that actually maybe uh, send the final or reliable signals to insects or uh, many other organisms. So. My question is uh, whether you have already tested or information on these. If you check the different mix or ratio of different, uh, th this important or the whole uh, volatile blends, how these moss and the parasites actually resp respond to these, and and whether you think uh, from this uh, applied point of view in pest management. Uh, whether this would be a consideration, for example, and not only just use one type of volatiles, but actually considering to have a mix. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an excellent question, I think. And, and uh, nature gives us these big mixtures and sometimes we ignore them, right? And um, yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm certainly guilty of that myself. I think, um, I think you made a good point that the mixtures could be important. I think in our work, we usually started out with the mixtures and then broke them down and showed individual compounds were important. But, um, you know, building on your point a little, you I mean, the mixture is what's out there. Um, so we really need to put the individual compounds back in and then say, how does it work with, within the context of the mixture? Um, so that is of course important. And even um, I think, this is probably, you know, because of the way we do science, it's part of the, <laughs> is a construct really of just trying to figure out which specific compounds are important, but then acknowledging that in, in a blend, they, they, they may do something different. So you're absolutely right. It's important to know, we, we again, first checked that the overall blend was, and then went back in and tried to find out which compounds were important. Um, but, and in this case, we don't necessarily know until we test the individual compounds, whether there's a, a repellent hiding in an attractive blend. So that's where the advantage of checking this and actually doing electrophysiology, because it might be true as I think you suggest in your question that a blend could come, could switch from being repellent to attractive with small changes in individual components. Um, so 
if you want to apply these, obviously it would be good to know exactly what the individual compounds are doing. Um, because if you just use the mixture, you might actually be wasting your time by throwing attractive compounds out there when you really want to repel as well. Um, but um, I think you also raised a good point that the mixture might be even more repellent maybe. So there could be some synergistic properties of the mixture and maybe this is why nature actually uses these mixtures. And I think that's even more intriguing. Um, I spent years studying enzymes that make mixtures of products for this reason, thinking that maybe the mixture was special. So um, I think if you're gonna apply compounds really, you would like to be as simple as possible and find a repellent compound that you can use. But it's good to keep in mind that the response might be due to the mixture. And uh, if there are other components of the mixture, of course, it's great to know what their effect is as well, um, because they could be working for you or against you. Um, to really do this, of course, you need the neurological basis of the response to know, almost to know whether um, it's happening as well as behavior. Um, so yeah, it's an intriguing problem. And with the number of volatiles there, it's gonna be a constant problem um, that both scientists, both basic and applied scientists would love to simplify, but the complexity is, is you know, not something you can escape from easily. Thank you very much. Thanks.